Okay, give me, let me get the timer right so I don't talk, talk too much. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'm our institute's guy behind uh, the infrastructure, behind um, our institute's transition from a mix of uh, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Perl, Oracle, and whatnot uh, to an open source e ecosystem. And obviously R has played a huge role in this. And today I present Time Series DB, which is a mapper from R time series objects to um, post sql key value pairs and relations. I'm not going too much, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about um, the technical details on a database level, but more about the motivation, um, why you wanna pair R with the database. Um, in general, I think we are in a good place with, with, uh, with R. We um, are, well, we have a nice software, we have a nice, we have a nice package. We, we, we are not stuck with Excel, right? Um, we could rather feel good about ourselves. Um, R is a, a great piece of software. I mean, that's why all of us are here. And also from a time series perspective, there are so many possibilities what you could do with time series, even if you feel like uh, there are too many time series approaches in R. There are great packages like Christoph's work, for example, who allow you to be agnostic uh, of all of that. So why would you want to pair R with the database? Why add to our stack? I mean, honestly, time series DB is a, um, it's your itch, it's your project type of project. So all of my applications come out of economics and official statistics, but I heard we got a lot of forecasters in the room and maybe you can relate to some of those itches. So um, the first argument for using it, from my perspective, is you want to have long-lived data pipelines. When you work in official statistics, you have kind of low-frequency time series, monthly, quarterly, or even yearly releases. So it's almost implicit that you um, end up observing something over years or even decades so you need a data pipe, pipeline that fits and it, that, that also lasts and it's easy to be maintained. And love may last forever, but R set in stone. So at some point in time, you would like uh, to store the data to a file, which is like the normal uh, thing to do. And if you got thousands or millions of time series, at some point you might have those time series redundantly stored across files. They're not unique anymore. Um, in other words, it's, con it's kind of difficult to um, enforce constraints of any, any form in a file-based system. And that being said, you might have a colleague or two who like Dropbox and then you end uh, up with file names, with different file names, all sorts of final thing, final, final, final review, and you don't have that in a database. Rob's smiling, I saw that. Um, so yeah, we all know that. Um, so how does time series DB do it? Simply load the library, start, fire up the connection. And by the way, if you like RStudio, you can do that with the RStudio connections um, pane. So that's kind of uh, easy. Then we store time series in a list of time series, in a named list. I think it should say um, those unique identifiers are the, uh, the names of the elements of the list. And then you simply take the list object with all those time series and store that to the database. The other way around, also kind of easy, you have, um, again, the database connection, and then you read the time series. What's noteworthy on this slide is that no matter how many time series you read from the database, you always get back a list object, even if it's only a list of one, because I want to have the same data type coming back from the database. Um, speaking of multiple time series, reading multiple time series, there are several ways to do it. Of course, you can just pass on a vector of time series, of the ident identifiers, of the unique identifiers. You could also use regular expressions, which comes in kind of handy if you have a comprehensive set of, um, of keys, a, a real key system behind all of that, if you've got a large database. And then by using regular expressions, you can just grab an entire group or a data set that belongs together uh, in order to set up multivariate analysis. 
but um, you could, you're not limited to regular expressions here. You could also use sets of time series, which are simply vectors of time series names stored in a database, which um, is similar to what you do in a shopping cart, maybe in an e-commerce uh, application. And you see where this is going. Um, there are a lot of people still in data who don't use R or Python or a similar, a similar language, and these people are already struck. I mean, we feel already sorry for them. We don't want to bully them any further. So what we want to do is make it more accessible to them. And when you, when you have data in SQL, it allows web developers, for example, um, who don't know much about statistics to do their thing. For example, build a REST API using popular web technology. And you end up with something like this, where you got a URL, and you can dynamically, just by adding parameters to the URL, cause a database query and get the data back. And um, this is kind of agnostic of any language. You can program such a thing in, in, in any language. May it be Python, may it be Node, on whatever technology is, is out there. And also for the R user, I mean, what I've just shown implies that you have a direct connection to the database. With this REST API, there is no need for that, right? Um, and we saw the same. We built a, a little API wrapper package in R around our cough data API. And then you have a simple R function can just call with a, with a single line of, of code um, and even plot that right away. So that's a convenient way if you're outside of the institution um, to get the data through a REST interface. And all of this starts by putting the data out of a file system into a database. The second thing is comprehensive data descriptions. I mean, in Switzerland, we have three major official languages, German, French, and Italian, and we want to describe the, da the data in the, right, in the right way. Data description is very important, and if you look at CSV files with multiple headers, and there's not a, enough space to describe everything in a, in a header, and then people start having multiple headers or even ugly footers, and then it's hard to make it machine readable. Their approach is with the YAML header files and so on, but there is none, none of them is really dominant. So with the database, we simply store the thing in a separate table, and by a foreign key linking to that table, we can simply um, store multiple languages. In, in R, I mean, this is the relevant line. You have these, uh, this locale, and you simply go from English to French, and voila, la même chose en français. Um, all of the other code is pretty much gibberish to limit the output to something that fits the screen, but that's the general idea here. The third thing is probably the hot topic or the most relevant for the forecasting people, at least that's what I get the feedback from, from our, our guys in the forecasting. Um, when I look at economic statistics or as statistics from our FSO, I feel like they have a quote like this pinned to the wall, and um, that's kind of their motto. The, re the statistics get revised so often. And the problem about it is not the revision itself, but if you download it the next year and the year after that, you cannot be sure it's still online what they published. There's hardly any versioning of time series from the original publisher. So if you want to keep up with your forecast, benchmark your forecast, what you have to do is store the data on your own. And this is basically um, what you can do with, uh, with time series DB. Again, pretty simple extension of what we already seen. You can simply say, okay, I want to have the data that's valid on a particular day. So you get back the data, for example, for this quarterly time series that was valid or available to the researcher, in other words, at that point in time of, of this date. If you look at the same, time series, another version, another vintage, um, at some point in time, which is already in the next quarter, you see there is one more value for the third quarter of 2015, but you can also see that some of the values get revised. And it's just by reading the data from the vintage, vintage table, which, which keeps track of that. Um, you could also do, create these nice triangle kind of uh, matrices that all researchers know. That you get basically a real-time output from um, 
all from a, from a single time series, sorry. Okay, um, so this is what time series DB can do, uh, do for you in a, in a nutshell what the most important features are. And now I would like to go a little bit more into detail about how it works on a database side. It's kind of simple, we got six tables, time series main is like the main table, there you have no tracking of vintages. When you store a time series of the same name, gets overwritten, time series vintage is an extension of that, which basically um, is just an add-on that keeps track of the versioning. And then we got two meta description tables, which is basically because you don't want to translate all the uh, description, for example, there's no need to translate a username or a timestamp and, and all of that information. Um, and then there's the table that's, uh, that stores the set that I mentioned early on. If we look at um, the vintage table, which got all the important data types and all the tricks, um, on one slide we can see that we have this HDOR data type and the idea of the HDOR data type is to put all the time series, uh, sorry, put a single time series, the complete time series with all its observations into one single record and that reduces the number of records dramatically. Um, makes sense for an official statistic, statistician um, who never does any window operations on a database level because you get the entire time series out of the database anyway and then, um, yeah, do, do your thing in R or whatever software you use. Then um, note that validity is not a date, but a date range. And together with indices, this ensures that um, there is no, non-overlapping. That means no time, no time series of the same name have two valid time series or two relevant time series at the same point in time. Um, and also it's ensured that there is no hole in, the, uh, in this. So sometimes it happens that publications are late or that um, there is even no publication for one, uh, for one month, especially um, maybe in other, in other countries than, than, than Switzerland, this could very well happen. And then time series DB makes sure the previous time series is just extended until another time series follows and so on. So um, maybe on the way out, a uh, uh, little look at one record, uh, how it looks in the database. And um, yeah, this is basically just to see how it, how it works if, you, if you've seen stuff on a, on a database level. So no rocket science, no, no, no magic, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of proven and it worked well for us of, over all these years. So what can you take away from this presentation if nothing more than that at all? Um, Long-term data conservation is an important thing. If you look at data over decades and a database there is there to help. SQL has been there uh, for how many decades? I don't know exactly, but it will be there for quite a while. So you have a good system which is language agnostic on the programming side, so to say. Um, yeah, here my um, emojis got kind of eaten up by Windows. I don't know how that happened, but the idea is you can have comprehensive meter information um, you, yeah, in different languages. And maybe an important point to add in this summary is that you cannot, um, sorry, you can, you can have multiple um, languages and you don't need the same labels for all of these languages. You can have, let's say, I translate this to Italian, but this is not translated to Italian. With a rectangular structure, you would ha have um, missing values all the time if it was re rectangular. Um, then uh, Time Series DB is able to manage revisions for you. And what you can remember from under the hood is also what I was referring to uh, in the meta description, what I said about the meta description, it kind of combines the advantages of both the SQL stuff with the relational ideas, but also the NoSQL stuff with this key value type uh, of thing. So there's no need to move to Mongo or anything like that because Postgres can do both of it. Okay, um, on the way out, uh, last few seconds. Um, 
let me just say what uh, we are plan to do. There is a plumber-based REST API um, we are working on. So there is a REST API from win within R. The advantage is that if you download the package, the REST API would just ship with it. So th this could be a nice extension. <laughs> then even though big data is not that relevant for us, we are exploring green plumb and time scale. And what's noteworthy, it's also Postgres projects um, that help to extend this. So we are staying within the same system. And we are looking at role level security, meaning you can access this time series and you cannot and the other way around. Um, that's it for me. If you get any feedback, um, let me know on, on Twitter. And if you got more specific things, there's also an issue tracker on GitHub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Are there questions, comments? Well, thanks uh, for the nice talk. Um, does it work with raster data as well, or is it for one-dimensional data only? Um, Do you plan to integrate support for raster data, if not happened? Uh, well, as I said, it's, it's, uh, your itch, it's your project type of project. So we haven't had this itch as econom economists tend to look at uh, time series. And then the multivariate thing happens when you put all these time series together in an R session. But um, if you've got nice ideas, we are really, the project is really active um, and we keep on improving it. And if there is a need, just file an issue and try to explain it in, in more detail. But it's not currently, it, it doesn't do that. Other questions? So I have been working with DBI package for handling uh, such an operation before. And I have a huge problem that uh, Errors happening in inside Postgres are not shown in uh, R. So it, how do you handle in this package? OK. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. It's a good uh, thing. Um, the pro at the moment, we are using, uh, on the back end side, we're using Dirk Adelbüttel's package, uh, R PostgreSQL, to do the hard work. Um, and, but we might uh, switch to Kirill Müller's um, project, who um, works on Postgres, which um, also is closely linked to a um, standard compliant DBI specification um, with R. He worked on that for the R Association, and we've already talked uh, to him about that. I, I think that would uh, improve that, but we do have the same problem, and we only fix it by knowing a lot about SQL ourselves and looking on a SQL client what happens and SQL log files. But it's not good in R yet. <laughs>